Bien, este... Ya está. Listo. Ok. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, attending to this uh, double session of the web seminar. And we are going to, to have today two, uh, uh, two talks from uh, young researchers. The first one is uh, going to be uh, uh, Mokhtari Yassin from uh, University of Bourgogne, French Comte. And the title of his talk is uh, Boundary Stabilization of the 1D uh, Wave Equation in Non-Cylindrical Domains. So uh, when you want, you can start your Thank your you, Enrique, for the, for the introduction. So I will just reduce this window. <clears throat> so first of all, I want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my work here in this webinar. So my talk today is about a very basic problem, in fact, in control theory is of PDEs, is about boundary stabilization of the one-dimensional weight equations in non-cylindrical domains or with moving boundary, okay? It's the, just the same thing. So my, my talk will be organized as follows. First of all, I will talk a little bit about the problems and some related results in the same directions and what has been done until now. Then I will present the main results of my work, and then I will try to illustrate the results by some examples and different geometries of domains, and then I will provide a sketch with the proof. Then the aim of this talk, in fact, is to study this or the asymptotic behavior of the solution of the system S in this domain Q with its boundary conditions and with these initial states, okay? Where Q is uh, an open subset of R2, it's time and space in R2. The time is positive, of course. And X is lying between these two functions or the boundary functions, I call them alpha and beta, where alpha is less than beta. Uh, clearly, this Q is not any more rectangular. It is just an arbitrary shape, OK? I will just assume that at the instant T equals to 0, alpha 0 equals to 0, and beta 0 equals to 1. So we are in the, in the interval 0, OK? So the first equation is clearly the weight, the weight equation, one-dimensional, with speed equals to one, c, and and the Newman and the endpoint alpha. I will put Newman boundary conditions equal to this famous feedback law. Okay, this was understood in the classic classical settings or in the cylindrical domain case. And on the other endpoint, I will put directly boundary condition at beta, and third line just I like I just said is the boundary condition. There are, there is, in fact, many results in the literature in this direction and with moving boundary for hyperbolic systems, but I will just quote these works here uh, since they are related to my problem, the problem S. In 2007, Martin Gugat proved fine time stability in, and in these settings for beta equals to one and alpha prime, the C problem is less than one, for f, for f equals to one, then they proved, or he proved that time stability holds with an optimal time given explicitly. And in 2018, Amari and his collaborators proved that exponential decay for the energy of our system as holds in these settings, beta equals to one, alpha is periodic with the same assumption as in quad. And for particular class of feedback functions F, I've just said exponential decay rate proved for the energy. And very recently, four beta equals to one and alpha is given by this particular form is a linear function. Lu and Fang have proved polynomial decay rate with, with precise decay, uh, with precise exponents for the polynomial function or polynomial decay rate. Okay, so the aim of this talk is to understand what happens for general boundary functions alpha and beta, and how this can affect the behavior of the system. And the second aim is what happens when f depends on time, okay? So in this graph, I will do, use the following notations for any function z. I will call z plus minus this function, okay? So t plus zt is z, z plus, and t minus zt is z minus, okay? And I will denote by H1 index beta of alpha t beta t, this space V in H1 
such that V equals to zero and the endpoint beta T for any T. This is exactly matching with our own J conditions. I will assume further that the, the bond functions alpha and beta are C1 functions with alpha is less than beta. Otherwise, our domain will be reduced to one point, which is very likely, not very likely situation, in fact. And I will assume that F is different of minus one for any T. We see that why this assumption appear later. And I will assume that alpha prime and beta prime, the or the maximum of this to function or the supremum that are continuous is that than one, okay? And consequently, these functions defined earlier alpha plus minus, divided by t plus minus alpha and beta plus minus, t plus minus beta are invertible and these domains or these intervals. Okay, so to see that we have just to take, to take the derivative of alpha plus minus. We, for instance, for alpha plus minus, we obtain one plus or minus alpha prime, which is a strictly increasing function, therefore it is invertible and this set. We can do the same thing for this beta plus. In fact, assumption two is necessary for the existence. For instance, if assumption two is, is, no, is not satisfied, then we can, or we can construct, or can draw these Bonji functions. And at, as it is one well known for hyperbolic systems or this wave equation in particular, the information propagates along characteristics line. And if these Bonji functions move too fast, with respect to the speed of propagation of the wave, then we might find ourselves in or outside the domain, okay, in this green region. And therefore, the solution is not even well posed in these regions. Or if the boundary functions move too fast, then we can, or the boundary function or boundary condition can be never be satisfied, and therefore the system is well posed, it's ill posed. And the first Theorem is this is an existence theorem. If we assume that one, two are satisfied, then for any y zero, y one, and f in this energy space at the instant t equals to zero, and for any f continuous function, in fact, this assumption can be weakened to more to be just piecewise continuous function with f different of minus one, then there exists a unique solution to satisfying this regularity. Okay, this is just the classical result. In fact, we will see later that this, this regularity will, will be naturally appear in or for the exact solution formula that will be constructed later. And further, I will define this function phi depends on alpha and beta by this formula, okay? Since alpha plus, ma, uh, this is the inverse of this function exists, where the phi is well defined, and it is increasing function as composition of increasing function, and hence it is invertible in this domain. There's no problem, everything is okay. And I will define the sequence of functions, C, index N for any integers N, uh, by this expression here, okay? is defined from zero, phi of zero with positive value, I will call the expression of phi, okay? I just have to take zero here, beta minus inverse of zero. And with the positive value, it takes two to this finite product with capital F is given by this function, one minus F over one plus F, okay? It depends on time, of course. And uh, this notation, phi of the power of E between brackets refers to the and composite of phi. For instance, phi of the power of zero between brackets is the identity function, phi of the power of one between brackets is phi, phi of the power of two between brackets is phi composed with, it, uh, with itself, etc. Et okay? So it is just a notation to denote the, the composed of phi with itself of order n. And in addition to assumptions one and two, I will, set, I will assume that these sequence of functions, the composite, the and composite of n is an increasing sequence of functions and has an infinity as limits when n tends to infinity for any two, okay? In fact, we see later that this assumption is very natural. It replaces, in fact, letting time tends to infinity and since you are interested in the asymptotic behavior of system as we see that this is very natural assumption. And as usual for this kind of problems, I define the energy E, tends on time, to the norm of the solution in the classic in the our energy space, okay, it is given by this formula. 
Okay, so other energy, the, the bound of the integral depends on alpha, alpha, and beta. And the, uh, the first or the main results of this talk is the following. It let y0, y1f in the same energy space as previously. And under the assumptions one, two, three, the energy decays to zero if and only if this sequence of functions defined earlier decays to zero when n tends to infinity for any two, okay? This necessary and sufficient condition for the strong stability in some sense, we'll, we'll precise that later, for any two, okay? But this characterization, in fact, doesn't give a precise decay rate, okay? Uh, to, pre to precise the decay rate, if it is possible, if there exists some function g, g is continuous function from our both positive values, such that this sequence of function cn of two is equivalent to g, if there exists such g, g of the phi of the composite and composite of phi, okay? For any two, this equivalence holds for any two, then the energy decays like g, okay? So the decay rate is precise in this case. As a corollary, exponential decay is well characterized, characterized excuse me, uh, by the first or the previous theorem. It's a phase to take G equals to exponential omega T. And the, this energy or our energy, ET, is exponentially bounded with omega in R if and only if this limit is finite, okay? Clearly, if this omega is negative, then the energy is exponentially stable or our system exponentially stable with growth bound omega. And if omega equals to minus infinity, for instance, the solution is called super stable and the energy is, the decay of energy is faster than exponential function. But if omega equals to zero, then we cannot say anything, okay? We can just go back and finding some function G satisfying this equivalence and deducing the precise Decay rate. Another classical result for this system S is fine stability one, okay, for the same y0, y1, f, okay, in this space, e, under the assumptions one, two, and three, and the energy E vanish in fine time if and only if f equals to one and t is larger than this time t star, which depends on the Bonge functions. Okay, so F equals to one is the only values for which the energy vanish in finite time. In fact, for, in, for this particular system S, we have a very interesting corollary of the main results or the main theorem. In fact, instead of fixing a uh, feedback function F and studying the asymptotic behavior of our system, we can do the converse. We can fix a decay rate G and then finding some decay, uh, some feedback function F, okay, given by this formula, such that the energy decays like G, okay? So it is just the converse process, okay? We fix the decay rate G, and we find some function F, which depends on time, such that the energy decays like G. In fact, the proof, in fact, the proof of this corollary is not difficult. If we let capital F equals to this quantity, then the sequence of function C n of two, we can be, can be estimated by this F. We, can, we just replace F by its value. And there is some simplifications that will be done here. And finally, we obtain this formula, okay? And this exactly says that the G of the F composite n times or n plus one times, it's the same thing, is equivalent with our sequence of function. And since, F, capital F equals to one minus F over one plus F. We can just bring out F from this equality. And finally, we find this formula, okay? So we fix the decay rate, we find the function F for which the energy decays like G. Now I will try to illustrate the previous theorem by some examples. I will start by the standard domains or the classical settings, okay? It is alpha equals to zero and beta equals to one, of course. By the previous corollary, in these settings, this formula will be that, okay? So GT minus GT plus two over GT plus GT plus two, okay? So as I've just said, we can achieve any decay rate we want by just fixing the decay rate G and replace or plug in this G in this formula, okay? We can, for instance, achieve an exponential decay for any S. For this function F, 
on polynomial duplicate with in exponent s by our choice with this, this with this function f feedback function. For instance, we can achieve logarithmic decay rate with any exponent s of our choice by just selecting this function or feedback function f. Okay, we can achieve any decay rate. Okay, we can replace by any function we want. Now, if we let f t equals to t over two plus t, okay, so I will now applies theorem or the main theorem of this work is uh, and not the corollary, then capital F equals to one over T plus one, okay? In this case, we can compute these sequence of functions explicitly and this gives this formula, okay? And after some computations, we take into exponential and logarithm and making some equivalence, we find that this sequential function, Cn, is equivalent to this formula, okay? Now, if we try to compute the graph clearly before going to the growth bound, Cn2 is clearly has zero as limits, okay? It goes to zero when n goes to infinity, so the energy decays to zero, okay? But if we try to compute the growth bound, I try to apply the growth bound formula, okay? And we have just to replace this Cn in this formula. And in our case, the end composite of phi equals to two n plus two. It is just a simple computation to do. And we find that omega equals to minus infinity. And therefore the solutions are or is super stable in this case. Okay, this is just due to fact that f converges to one, as you can see here, and one is the value for which the energy vanishes in finite time. Okay, this, so this is so natural to expect, this expected in fact. And now I will move to the non cylindrical domain case. Okay. I will just try to apply our theorems or our results in these simple settings. I will take alpha equals to RT and beta equals to KT plus one. These functions are just lines for RK lying in minus one, one. And to satisfy assumption one and two, I will just assume that K greater or equals to one, and therefore alpha t is less than beta t, okay? Otherwise, the two lines will touch in each other. And by simple computations, we can find that the function phi is given by this formula, a2 plus b, where a80 is this quantity here, and b is this quantity, okay? And here we distinguish two cases, the first case, the, the, the two lines, alpha and beta, are not parallel. In this case, the end composite of phi is given by this formula. It has a, a, a geometric growth, okay? And for a equals, to, equals one, then this have an arithmetic growth, okay? So we have two cases to distinguish here. And if we try to make assumption three satisfied, okay, this equation of function must be increasing if and only if a greater than one. Otherwise, this cannot tend to infinity for a two. And two, to compute the sequence of function Cn, we have just to apply alpha min, uh, the inverse of alpha minus in this case. And in this particular case, it's a phase to multiply by one over one minus r, all the side of this, of phi to the power of or the composite of phi of order n, okay? I have just multiplied all this formula by one minus r. In fact, this figure corresponds to the case r equals to one. This line are parallel, okay? The black with the black, the orange with the orange, and the blue with the blue, the green with the green, etc. And this figure corresponds to the case r less than k, okay? The lines are not parallel. This alpha and this beta, okay? And I will begin by this, uh, the simplest case. In the non cylindrical domain case is when alpha, uh, f, the feedback function is constant function. It's different of minus one, one, okay? So in this case, the Cn or the sequence of function of Cn is just the, the products of f, capital F, n plus one times, okay? And in this case, if we try to compute the growth bound, we find that the growth bound is zero, okay? And therefore, we can not say anything about the decay rate, okay? Now, we try to apply the condition given in the, the first theorem or the main theorem, and we try to figure out 
in which decay rate this energy decays to zero. Okay. In fact, if we let G, T equals to T minus S, then with the choice of A and F, then the equivalence condition holds and therefore the decay of energy is polynomial with this exponent S where S is given explicitly by this formula. Okay, those, the, in fact, this exponent is exactly the exponent found by Fang and Lu in 2018. And if L equals to K, then the two lines are parallel. We can compute the ground bound, we obtain this ground bound, okay? So to make our energy exponentially stable, we have just to choose R and F so that this quantity be negative. Okay, that's all. Now I will take F as the first example, as the as authentic domain case. And I will just tell you that this choice of F led to super stability in the cylindric domain case. Now the question is, does this lead to the same results? I'll try to compute the, the in, in the first case, we compute the function, uh, the sequence of function, excuse me, C and of two, and is given by this formula, okay? Then after some computations and taking into account that A is larger than one, then CN can find that this sequence of functions, PN is equivalent to this quantity, okay? Now we can do the test. We can compute the growth bond. We find that omega equals to zero. Therefore, the decay is weaker than exponential, okay? So now we are, we will look for this decay rate. And if we observe here, that the, uh, the leading term in the, in, uh, of this formula or in this formula is a to the power of minus n squared over two, okay? So we have just to find uh, a function g so that this equivalence holds. And this holds, in fact, with this function g, okay? So in this case, in these settings, where the lines are in parallel, the energy decays like gt, which is exponential of logarithm squared. Okay, so there is some loss of energy as, as it is expected for this geometry. Now we treat the case of parallel lines for k equals to r after some computations. Okay, we can compute the growth bound omega equals to minus infinity, and therefore the solution is super stable, or it is it, it is or the k is faster than any exponential function. Okay. Now I will provide sketch of the proof, okay? The proof is very simple, okay? It's, it's a phase to introduce this Riemann invariance, P and Q. P is yt minus yx, and Q is yt plus yx. And this P and Q, these new variables satisfy this system, okay? With capital F is defined earlier. In fact, if we try to compute our energy with these new variables, we find that for energy equals to PQ in the atomic. And therefore the stability problem is well translated, okay? So instead of studying this problem, we are just to study this problem with new components. And another observation to, to make is that this, uh, this system is, encoupled, is, is not coupled from the anterior, okay? It just coupled in the boundary, okay? So we can solve these equations alone in Q and this equation with itself in Q and then using the boundary condition to find the exact solution, okay? To do so, I will start by splitting the domain Q into an infinite number of parts, okay? I will call them sigma Pn that correspond to the component P and sigma Qn that correspond to the component Q. This sigma Pn and sigma Qn are those between the red regions. Sigma P0 is here. Sigma P1 is between these two, uh, two red lines or arrows. Sigma 2P is between these two, etc. For sigma QM, it is between this line, okay? And this first blue line, sigma 2 is, uh, sigma 1 is between these two blue lines, etc. okay? In fact, if we denote by P and Q and the restriction of the states, P and Q, and these two and these regions, sigma P and sigma Q and then you can find the exact solution 
to our system in each region. For instance, by using the characteristics method, we can prove that P0 equals to this formula and Q0 equals to this formula, okay? So this is just uh, this quantity is just the restriction of the solution P and the region sigma P0 and this. This is just the restriction of the solution and the origin sigma Q0. And by using the reflection of characteristics, we can prove also that P1 is given by this formula, okay? And we can observe that the capital F appeared in this formula, but not yet for the Q, okay? We have just to make one reflection to make this capital F appear. And for P2 is given by this formula and Q2 is given by this formula, okay? So in this two formula, the capital F appeared and work C is just to simplify writing, okay? It's just given by this quantity, doesn't affect anything. And we observe here that the, this solution vanish in finite time if and only if, if F equals to zero. And it's possible if and only if F equals to one, okay? And this is, this can happen starting from the time when Q equals to zero, that is this time, okay? We have just to allow to understand. It's not very hard. We can do the same process n times. I, I can find that in the regions gamma sigma p to n plus one, the solution or the restricted solution is given by this formula, okay? We can observe that this finite product appear finally and P2 and plus two index is given by this formula, okay? The same thing holds for Q, Q of two and plus one is given by this formula. The finite products appeared also. And for Q two and plus two is given by this formula, okay? So clearly the asymptotic behavior of our solution depends only on this quantity, okay? Since these, these quantities are just initial state and we have just to study this, find products and find out how to deal with. The, so as the aim is to, is to estimate the actual norm of the components P and Q. And by this figure, for instance, if we, try to estimate for a fixed T the, the norm of P. We have to take in account that P in this case depends on the expected solution when X varies across this interval, this P1 and this P0, okay? And in this case, for instance, the, so the solution P depends on three values of P, depends on sigma P3, sigma P2 and sigma P1, okay? So P in this case depends on three, Restricted solutions. And however, for this case, we have just to, to estimate only P3, okay, in this interval. So I will choose to deal with the worst case that may occur, okay? So if P is expressed in function of three values, P2 and minus one, P2 and P2 plus one, then by taking the norm of the component P, in the alpha norm of alpha t, beta t, then it is exactly this norm, okay? Then I will integrate over x, or x cross this small interval here, then x is lying between these two lines, right? And finally, between this point and beta of t, okay? In fact, by using the exact solution formula, we can just take the supremum, of this finite product over x, where tx are in, in these regions, okay? So x cross these sub intervals. By definition of the regions sigma, sigma and p, we can in fact express this region explicitly or analytically. In fact, tx in the, uh, is or belongs to this region if and only if t minus x belongs to this interval, okay? It depends on uh, and phi and n, okay? And it's exactly the image of the, of the function phi composed n minus time of this interval, okay? So the same thing happens with odd index. Tx is in this region. If I'm doing if t minus x belongs to this interval, 
it depends on phi and zero, okay? So if you bring out phi, composed n times out of this interval, you find that t minus x belongs to the image of the phi composed n times of this interval. And therefore, there exist two sequences depending on t and x, two one and this interval, and two two depend on t and x and this interval such that if t x in this region, then t minus x equals two phi composed n minus time of this sequence, two one. Okay, this is just a consequence of this writing. Okay, and similarly for the case, for the other case, t x is in this region. Then there exists a sequence two two and depending on t and x in this interval such that t minus x equals to this quantity is the composite n of, of order n of this sequence. And I will now make a little observation that if t x this capital runs this regions, then this sequence remains bounded. Okay, and they rise all these intervals. And therefore, this sequence in fact doesn't affect the computations, and we can just consider them as uh, two parameters, two one and two two. Okay. Next, I will try to estimate this this product or this quantity, and I have just to replace t minus x by its value defined or found found earlier. Okay. I will. Replace t minus x by this quantity if I am in this interval, okay, and by this quantity if I am in the regions sigma p to n plus one. And this lead to these formulas. And since the inverse of the function phi, the the the, the e order of composition composed with this phi. There will be some simplifications here. For, for instance, for this case, we obtain phi of n minus e minus one. And here, phi of the power of n minus e minus one. And here, the same thing. And these are just this sequence of function defined earlier. OK? Over the supremum is taken over the, those values. Zero, this quantity. And this quantity phi zero, okay. And this finally gives the supremum over zero phi zero of this sequential function, okay. So we have arrived at this level, and and the decays of solution holds or occurs if and only if the supremum of this function over zero phi zero decays to zero. In fact, we can deal with with Q in the same way, and we can prove that Q is bounded by the same by the same quantity. In fact, from now it's very clear that if this holds, if this comes for function of this two, of this parameter, if the supreme turns to zero, then this implies that the energy decays to zero. And since I will just go back, and since t minus x equals to the phi composed n minus time, okay, so sending t to infinity is the same thing as sending phi composed n minus one time of sending n here to infinity, okay? So this just plays the role of two parameters. And this plays, in fact, the role of the time, phi composed and kind of it does. And if there exists some g, we can just apply or making the, this simple equivalence to deduce the decay rate right, of the solution, okay? Since this plays the role of time and this is the bound of the energy. And for the necessary part, without cost of generality, in fact, the proof is straightforward. If this sequence of function Tn doesn't tend to zero, without cost of generality, you can just choose the infinimum, this two, so that this doesn't convert to zero, and therefore we can just bound this quantity from below by this by the infinimum of this quantum function f. And clearly that if this doesn't convert to zero, then the solution doesn't convert to zero. Okay. So the puff necessary part is straightforward. And thank you for listening.
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, time for some questions or comments. Oh, yeah. You can activate your switch off, switch on your your microphone or write in the chat if you prefer. So. Is there any question? So let, I have a, a question. Have you looked at any extension of the, of the result for higher dimension? I mean, uh, if you have the weight equation in several dimensions, several special dimensions. Mm, uh, an analog no. of the model or? Uh, there is results by Bardos and Chan. It backs to the IT. They prove that without using any feedback, that energy uh, decrease in a polynomial decade, I think, if I remember, if the domain is extending, okay? It depends on the shape of the domain. Otherwise, we prove that uh, the energy is bound from below by, by a polynomial function, I think, if, I do, if the domain is con contracting. So it depends generally of the domain, but, here, I have obtained unnecessary and sufficient conditions since the computation are easier. But for the higher dimension, perhaps macro local uh, techniques will help. Okay, so the problem is in the low frequencies. I think, you know, I think, yeah. Okay, and uh, another question is, uh... The following is uh, your result connected to uh, can be connected to uh, any kind of a free boundary problem. I mean, uh, if uh, alpha and beta are not known, if they are known and you are imposing additional conditions on the boundary, uh, have you any idea of what to do? Uh, uh, can or? you can you can you repeat, Professor? Uh, I, don't, yes. I don't understand the question. Yes, uh, in your in your in your work, alpha and beta are fixed. You are yes. working with uh, you are yes. working with a moving domain, but it is fixed. It is not free. Ah, so, okay. uh, yeah. what about if one of them, for example, alpha, is not known, is unknown, and uh, you have an additional condition uh, on the boundary, and you get a free boundary problem? Uh, do you have any idea of? Uh... Uh, okay, uh, I think I think I understand. So since we have the exact solution of formula, I think that this is doable. Okay, uh, because it, it it's a tough to to look for uh, uh, an assumption. For instance, from here uh, we have the exact solution formula, and under some assumptions, I think that I can get something. Yeah, yeah, I get some some conditions. So the advantage here is. We know the exact solution for me. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. So is Thank you, there sir. Any, other, any other question, any other comment? Okay, thank you again. And uh, you. so we are going to pass to the second speaker. I'll stop sharing my screen. Oh. Yes, please. And uh, Tom, uh, Please switch on your camera and uh, try to, okay, to share your slides. Okay. Well, the second speaker today is uh, Thomas uh, Ashley. Uh, I know him uh, rather well. So uh, <laughs> uh, welcome to our uh, seminar. And uh, he's going to, be get, uh, to give a talk uh, a little different from the, what we have been uh, 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 listen uh, up to now. Uh, it is different because the subject is, uh, as you are going to see, very uh, special, and also the methods that he is going to present are not exactly the same that uh, we have been uh, visiting these days. Uh, but I think that it is very interesting. We have thought that it was very interesting to make him speak in this seminar because uh, uh, the subject by itself is uh, very interesting, as you are going to see. Uh, it concerns the optimization of the uh, solar energy uh, production. 
and uh, also uh, I think that it can leave open uh, a lot of the questions in control and in optimization uh, that maybe uh, that maybe interest you. So uh, uh, thank you for uh, participating in this uh, in this seminar. Uh, the talk is uh, the title of the talk is uh, new methods and results in the optimization of solar power power plants uh, thanks Enrique. thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak today um i think Enrique said it all really this this talk is going to be a bit different it's much more applied and i will be skimming over the the theory the equations i'll be presenting the main ones here today but the in-depth study, I won't be going into detail. So this work was completed over a long period with uh, the produce being various articles with my professors Enrique and also Emilio Caratosa. And this was done at the University of Seville. So I'm gonna give an introduction into what this is about, the, um, the application, what it means, because maybe it's something that we haven't seen before. Then I'm gonna talk about the two main topics one of them is called aiming strategy that has uh, three parts. And then I'm gonna briefly introduce the cleaning scheduling, which is another topic. There, I'm not gonna go into any detail, but merely introduce the topic. And then finally, if I've got time, talk a little bit about future research, because this is something that I would like to continue researching, because as Enrique said, it's something very interesting and something that we should be continuing to research as a community. So, Firstly, what is this about? This is about renewable energy. There's many forms of renewable energy, and I think we can all agree that it's uh, an interesting topic and actually an important topic because we really need to stop relying on fossil fuels and change to some of these uh, sources of energy that are a lot cleaner and a lot more sustainable for the environment. In my work, I've been focusing completely on solar energy, okay? There are many types of solar energy and our particular type that we focused our research on perhaps is one that you've not encountered before. So the most typical that we all know about is the photovoltaic. So you can get a photovoltaic cell that's put on top of your house, for example, and it gives you energy. No? Another type is to do with the thermal. So use the thermal energy produced by the sun to drive some form of electricity process. Now, my particular type of solar thermal energy is called a concentrating plant, where we're looking to focus the instant solar ra radiation onto a point, but, okay? And our particular type uses what's known as a heliostat, and these are basically mirrors. So the summary of this is that these power plants are solar power plants, and they use concentrating techniques to focus instant solar radiation onto a point, and then the thermal energy that's generated by that concentrated radiation is used to drive a, um, a traditional heat exchanger, a steam engine, for example. So here's an example of one of these solar power tower plants, as they're called. We have a field of helistats or mirrors, which are very large. They can be the bigger than cars, which are able to rotate during the, the course of a day to continuously focus the instant solar radiation to a, a receiver, which is mounted on the top of a tower. As you can see here, this is a, it's showing white hot because the concentrated thermal energy is really high. So in, for example, this, uh, this plant, the instant radiation, the heat generated by that is transferred using a fluid, for example, molten salt, and that thermal energy is then used to drive a traditional steam, steam turbine. Now, in our group, we've been looking at various parts of these systems and how we can improve them, how we can optimize them. Because in reality, these systems are very inefficient. We lose a lot of energy um, through various means. So one of the things that we, um, the group looked at actually before I joined was to do with the location of the heliostats or mirrors in the field. So this is in the design phase of these plants. How can we locate the heliostats around the tower, considering the instant radiation, 
in order to maximize the efficiency of the plug. So various things were considered, various optimization models and uh, simulation programs, whereby the number and location of the helistats were determined in order to maximize the, uh, the energy efficiency of the tower, or the plant in general. Now, for my work, we've been concentrating more on the side where we now have a solar power tower plant. It's been designed, it's been built, and we want to optimize its operation. So throughout the two parts of this talk, I'm gonna be concentrating on a particular case. And this is a uh, PS10 solar power tower plant, which is located close to Seville in Spain. And we use this plant because it's well known in the literature and we can uh, do lots of comparisons and numerical approximations. So this is the plant, this one here. We have a tower and we have 624 helistats in a radial configuration, which are concentrating the solar energy onto this tower. For this location in Spain, we also have data to do with the instant radiation. So for every month of the year, we have radiation curves that allow us to accurately model how much radiation would be arriving to the tower at certain time points during a day. So the first part I said, the first of the two topics is called aiming strategy. And there are three, three sub parts of this, um, of this theme. So the first article that came out of this work was called optimization of aiming strategy in solar power tower plants. So what do I mean by an aiming strategy? It's literally uh, what it sounds like is to look at the optimization of the point at which each, each heliostat in the field looks at on the receiver surface. Now, this is important for the efficiency of the, the, uh, the plant because the radiation distribution on the receiver surface, in this example, a flat square, is directly controlled by where the mirrors are looking. So for example, if we were just wanted to maximize the energy received, we would aim all heliostats at the center of that receiver. And that might be a good strategy. But for example, at midday, especially in Seville, it gets very hot in the summer. So if we aim all heliostats at one point, we will burn the receiver. The receiver. And uh, this has happened in, at various plants where they've had too much thermal load on the receiver and it causes permanent damage. So this is something that we have to take into consideration and there's various forms of how to do this. So what we have considered is applying a mathematical optimization problem to in to optimize the efficiency in terms of maximize the energy reaching the receiver, whilst also making sure that there's no burn. So we put a maximum on the allowed radiation, radiation at any point on the receiver. And also due to our work with um, uh, companies that actually build these towers, we know that the more efficient distribution to have on the receiver is not just to go for the maximum. We want to aim for a target distribution. So for example, we could look to homogenize the radiation across the receiver because that may actually help thermal transfer through the material. So really our objective here is to maximize radiation whilst also obtaining a target distribution. So we do this. To be able to do this, we have to be able to model the energy distribution on the receiver surface. So our input is the instant radiation from the sun at that particular location on earth. And we then have to use a particular distribution, which is a well-known distribution in the literature, to model how that light, would, uh, that uh, radiation would then reflect on the heliostats and then reach the receiver. So here we have the, what's called the spillage efficiency, which is basically the proportion of the energy that falls on the receiver. When we consider the location of the heliostat in the field and also its tower properties, how tall is the tower, et cetera, that, et cetera. So I'm not going to go into detail about the coefficients because there are many coefficients in this equation and efficiencies depending on the, the weather, et cetera. But if we assume that the receiver is a circular receiver, we can find the, uh, the proportion of re reflected energy that reaches the receiver using this equation. So if we're able to do this, we can then look to build an optimization model to optimize what reaches the receiver. In this first part of the work, we use a basic model. So we're going to apply a binary integer linear programming model, whereby on the circular receiver that we've assumed, which is this red line here, in this case, it's uh, got a diameter of six meters. 
we're going to assign 25 points, for example, where the heliostats may aim. So they're not free to move uh, to aim at any point. They have a fixed selection of aim points that they can look at. So each heliostat will look at one of these points. And we assign binary variables to indicate this. Uh, I will say here that this is just an example, the 25 aiming points. We could do any configuration and any number. Our approach and model was uh, very flexible in this case, and also changing the shape of the receiver. So as I said before, we're looking to maximize, and this is the energy reaching the receiver. And we constrain this problem with a set of constraints. And the main ones here to, for us to consider are the fact that we want to keep within a maximum value for the radiation on any point of the receiver, and also to maintain a target distribution, which we've assumed to be homogeneous for the demonstration case. To demonstrate this model, at certain time points over a day, we use the, the plant I mentioned earlier, PS10, 624 aiming point uh, kilostats, and define those 25 aiming points in that con configuration. So just a note here, green is the center point, and the darker colors are the edges, just to know for this, the future pictures. If we consider how we did this, uh, the simulation model, we used the software Python and the solver Groby to make this uh, algorithm work. And we found that with a 30 second time limit on that solver, we were able to get uh, satisfactory results. I'm gonna demonstrate for three time periods during a day just to show how the aiming strategy will change. So if we consider the, the morning case, the first solar hour of the day, the sun is in the east, which is on the left here. The efficiencies are important in the calculation, but I won't go into the importance of the cosine efficiency, basically due to the, the angle between the sun and the tower. What we see here is that all of the heliostats in the east of the field are focused on the middle of the receiver, whilst the heliostats in the west are all focused around the edges of the receiver. And this is due to the shape of their distribution as it reaches the receiver. These heliostats are reflecting light in a much narrower distribution than the ones in the east of the field, which makes sense due to the angle between the sun and the receiver. This we can then use to model how much radiation reaches the receiver, and we gain a distribution of this sort. So we see that it's quite homogeneous and that the maximum value at each of these points where there are more heliostats looking is less than the maximum that we defined. We can then do the same, but now for the middle time point of day, noon, the sun is now overhead, so we don't expect to see much difference between both sides of the field. And what we do see is now that the heliostats here in front of the tower are concentrating at the center. This is something we expect because the heliostats here, dead center in the front, give more energy overall during the year just because of their location in the field. We then also see that there is much more radiation, but we still maintain quite a homogeneous distribution. And then the third example, last solar, solar of the day, we see a symmetric result from the first solar, solar of the day. So this result was uh, highly expected and the same for the distribution. We also considered in this piece of work, inclement weather, because we know from our industry partners that one problem, for example, is uh, cloud cover. If a cloud is passing over the heliostat field, that reduces the amount of radiation that reaches the receiver and then quickly increases it when the cloud passes. And this contrast in thermal energy on the receiver can cause thermal stress and destroy the receiver. So there is active research into this uh, field of uh, predicting cloud cover and how we can avoid it by changing aiming strategies in order to prevent burn. We did this uh, a small investigation into this using the stochastic linear programming technique, which we just applied to the previous model. Now, the second part of the, the same topic on aiming strategies, we take this one step further. We change this to a continuous problem, which produced this article. Instead of fixing the aiming points on uh, uh, coordinates on the receiver surface, like I did with the 25 points before, we now define an aiming point for each heliostat in the field. Uh, so now a continuous variable within the domain uh, omega. We do then do the same calculations, considering a separate aiming point for all heliostats, and we calculate the, uh, the energy reaching the receiver for each heliostat at any aiming point. 
we again have the same objective. We want to maximize energy, but we want to maintain a target distribution if we can. So now we consider this, because we are, we're now talking about a continuous problem, we can consider it as a weighted penalized objective function with a weighted weighting function A. So with the value of A, we can say decide which is more important, maximize energy or maintain a, a distribution that we desire, which would be the target distribution here. This, for example, would be important because at the first solar hour of the day, we may want to just heat the receiver. So we focus on uh, this part of the objective function. But at noon, it's much more important to maintain below a maximum radiation value. So we may want to put more emphasis on the second part of the objective function. Okay. We consider a, uh, a numerical approximation of our function uh, of this form called G for our aiming point set P. And to solve this, we now apply a gradient descent algorithm. So we start from a randomized aiming point strategy. That was our, our way of starting the algorithm. And we take steps in the direction of the maximum gradient using a, a projection algorithm, just in case. If an aiming point takes a step too large and uh, is aiming away from the receiver, we use a projection function to bring it back to the receiver because we want to assume that all Healy stats look at the receiver. To go through each iteration of this algorithm, we need the step size. So what we're using in this work is a modified R Medios rule with a constant epsilon, where we then use an iterative line search to find the best step size in each iteration of the gradient descent algorithm. And then we take that step. Again, for this, we present the results for the same plan. So we can do uh, comparisons later. Here, we now don't have those 25 aiming points, but we need to test the radiation on the receiver surface. So we defined 900 aiming point uh, test points on the receiver surface so that we can com compare the target distribution and our distribution. We also decided to test for 100 values, different values of A between zero and one. So putting more importance at the radiation maximum and more importance at the uh, target distribution desired. We again wrote this in Python, the code, with the gradient descent algorithm, but we no longer used a solver. We wrote our own bespoke, bespoke solver, which uh, worked quite well for this problem. And we found that each run, as in each gradient descent algorithm for each value of A, took less than 10 seconds. So in, all in all, it was a fairly speedy algorithm. I'm going to present just two examples for this algorithm for different uh, values of A. So in this example, we have a value of A of 0 0.9. So that means we're putting more emphasis on maximizing the radiation. We don't really care about the target distribution, which is homogeneous in this case. We can see this here on the left with the aiming points. They're all quite central. There's a huge group of them here. There's 624 in total. So we can see there's quite a number here in the center. And the resultant radiation distribution on the receiver surface is quite high and it's not homogeneous. We have a large peak in the middle. So that was an expected result for one value of A. If we now look at another example, but with a different value of A, for example, 0 0.3, we're now saying it's much more important to have the target distribution, which in this case is a homogeneous one we see that the aiming points are a lot more spread out and the resultant distribution is a lot lower and quite homogeneous. So again, this was an expected result. And we then looked at all 100 runs of this algorithm and looked to compare the two parts of the objective function. So here we can see this, we have 100 runs. And in these axes, we're looking at the two parts of the objective function. So total radiation, which is the first part, and the deviation from the target distribution. So we're looking to minimize this objective and maximize this objective. For that reason, we can construct the, the Preto front where we're not going to improve on either of the two objectives. And we can conclude that these, the parameters that lead to these results are the best here. So in this simulation with the, the Python script that we wrote, we know that our problem is highly multimodal. 
So starting from a random solution is going to bring us to a local optimum, not the global. So what we did was to make a multi-star procedure. And for each value of A, we ran it 30 times with a randomized initial aiming strategy. And we found with that that we were highly, well, quite likely to find a global solution and not be stuck in a local solution. Uh, also for each value of A, so each of the 100 values in the gradient descent algorithm, we found that we only needed 10 iterations of the algorithm to find the, the solution for that value. And this is due to the uh, modified Armijo's rule that we are using for the step size selection. We're taking the best step size in, in each iteration, so we converge quite rapidly. Then that leads us to the, the final part of this first topic of the aiming strategies, the dynamic case. Now this piece of work is was a lot more theoretical and we won't have time to go into the details of that today, but this now begins to be much more interesting, much more applicable to the real world, because this is, this is something that we, we should take into account really, is how can we optimize that continuous aiming strategy, but now across time, so it's a dynamic problem. Here's a summary of that problem. We're looking to maximize the same objective function as before. Here we have the, um, the energy, we're looking to maximize the energy distribution. And here we're looking to minimize the de deviation from a target distribution. Difference here is that we're integrating across time and we still have the, the weighting parameter A. Now, because we're talking about a dynamic problem across time, we have to think a bit about what happens physically in the tower as we change time. Well, we introduced two dynamic constraints to consider this. The first one here is considering the velocity of the rotation of the heliostats. These are very big, they're very heavy mirrors, so they have a maximum turn speed. So we need to ensure that our change in aiming point in the receiver between two time steps doesn't change too, too rapidly because the heliostats are not able. And also it could cause instability later if we decide that an aiming point can change from one side of the, the receiver to the other side in the next time step. We're not, we can't allow that because it would start to create instability in the results. The second one is to do with the actual thermal properties of the receiver. We don't want the change in the radi radiation on a single point of the receiver to change too much in one time step because that thermal shock could burn the receiver. So here we have the derivative of that distribution cannot change by a value tau two within a time step. So here we have two dynamic strains with our objective function. Again, we have to consider this as a optimization problem and consider algorithms to compute this. So we consider two algorithms in this case. The first one is a penalization algorithm. Again, we're looking to optimize, maximize, our objective function as before across time, considering our aiming points within their set. And here we have as M our constraints. So this can be boiled down to this penalization problem where we have a penalization parameter mu and our constraints. And here the calculated gradient for that. The second algorithm is an augmented Lagrangian algorithm, which again is considering an unconstrained optimization problem now with uh, two penalization parameters instead of the, the one in the previous algorithm. So again, we consider our objective function and our constraints in an unconstrained optimization problem. Okay. For this, um, both of these algorithms, we apply a gradient ascent algorithm again. And again, we have to use a projection algorithm because a uh, projection function, sorry. If the heliostats end up aiming away from the receiver, we want to make sure they keep aiming at the receiver. So we apply a projection algorithm within the gradient ascent. And again, we also apply Armijo's rule for each iteration of the gradient ascent algorithm, just to ensure that we're taking the best time step with the iterative line search to ensure the, the maximum time step taken. Now, this is again presented on the same solar power tower plant with the 624 heliostats. We consider 10 time points across a particular day. 
and we we define limits on the dynamic constraints that I've mentioned before. We define that the velocity limit of a heliostat turn rate is 0 0.5, and the, uh, the gradient of the uh, temperature change on a receiver surface, we define to be this value here. Again, this problem is now dynamic. We need to consider how the rate, the input to the problem changes with time. So this is what I mentioned at the start. We have radiation information for this location on Earth for various months of the year and various time steps across a day. So what we're going to do is consider those, um, those profiles as input to our problem. Again, we applied the algorithms in Python without using the solver. We wrote our own bespoke solver and found that the solution to this problem, we could, uh, for the 10 time points, could be found in less than three minutes. As I said, the instant radiation changes. So we can select one of these curves, which represents a different month of the year, where we can look at the instant radiation on the field for various time steps during the day. So if we wanted to consider time steps that are, are not time points on this graph, we considered a interpolation between the data we had available. We're going to start the simulation at the first solar hour of the day, and then I'm going to show some results going stepping through the time. Okay. We start with a random aiming point strategy, as before, and we step to the next time step. So we're looking to maximize the energy whilst maintaining a um, less than a uh, less than a maximum energy profile on the receiver surface so as to not burn it. And what we expect here at the start of the day is for the heliostats to move towards the center, but they have to respect the dynamic constraints. So this is what we see here in the, the first time step. All of the heliostats have moved towards the center because they're looking to maximize the energy, but they have not moved a great distance. And this is because they are not allowed to rotate too much in one time step. So we can then continue to the next solar hours. Here's the second and third. Again, we're following the same pattern. We want to maximize the energy because we're at the start of the day. There's not much sun yet, but we can't move too quickly because of the dynamic constraints. Now, when we start to move towards the middle of the day, where we now have quite a lot of solar energy in Seville, we can see here that whichever curve we choose here, we're starting to see quite a lot of instant radiation. We're now going to expect to see that the maximum limit of the receiver is going to be reached. And we should no longer start to, we should no longer continue to move all aiming points to the center of the receiver. And this is exactly what we see between these two time periods. In this time period, we've moved again towards the center to maximize the energy. But now we see that the value of the instant radiation at the center point of the receiver has got too high. So we need to separate the aiming point slightly to maintain below the maximum limit. And this is then seen throughout the rest of the simulation. We can continue to see increase in temperature and the uh, aiming point strategy maintains this pattern throughout the rest of the simulation. And uh, that's the end of the, the aiming point work, the, the three problems that we've considered. I will say before, before we get to the future work, that is something that we can definitely continue to work with because there are lots of ways we, we could improve and change that piece of work to do something more interesting. But before we talk about that, if we have time, I'm going to briefly introduce another topic we considered, which is, again, something for the, the maintenance of an already built solar power tower plant. And that is the cleanliness of the mirrors. Of, of course, in areas where there is a lot of solar energy, there is a, a lack of water normally, so the area is quite dusty. And it is the case for these solar power, power, solar power tower plants, the heliostats end up with a coating of dust on top of them, and they need to be cleaned quite regularly. So what we looked to do was to optimize the schedule in which they clean those heliostats. So again, we're looking to maximize the energy reaching the receiver whilst considering a, a cleaning process. So I'll just briefly outline what we did. And uh, we did this using a three-stage optimization process, where firstly, we clustered the heliostats into groups, because we also considered groups, uh, heliostat fields, 
with uh, thousands of helistats. These fields can have more than 100,000 helistats in them. So it's really important to consider how we clean them. We then ran a scheduling optimization where each of those helistats groups was assigned to a particular period in a, a time period, for example, a week. Which helistat groups do we clean in which day, for example? And then a last step was some local search heuristics, where here we wanted to improve root attractiveness, as we called it. And this was to do with if we clean a particular group of helistats on one side of the field, in the same day, we don't want to clean another group of helistats on the other side of the field, because that would involve more driving for the vehicle that cleans the helistats. So we used a local search heuristic to minimize that effect using a rolling optimization procedure. So as I said, I'm not going to go into details about any of those models. Just look at a brief result to see what they, they look like. If we considered a period of 16 days, we for the same PS10 field, we clustered the helistats into 52 groups, and we allowed cleaning of four groups per day. So from this graph, we see in white the helistats that are allocated to be cleaned on a particular day. And what our optimization problem initially did was uh, maximize the radiation received due to the cleaning, and then ran a rolling optimization to minimize the distance between the groups on a particular day. In some cases, for example, period three, we see that the helistats being cleaned are all in a group there, but potentially in period one, we have a group here and a group here. So room for improvement, yes, depends on the parameters that we put in, into the model, the importance we put on the distance between the groups. And the resultant radiation profile was uh, calculated. So we could compare this with what we assume to be the cleaning procedures that the plants use. Again, written in Python, we used we returned to use the Grobi solver. And for the 16 time period example here, we set a time limit of 10 minutes, as we found that to be an acceptable uh, receive a recept, uh, acceptable result. And I think I have time now just to speak a little bit about what the future work, the future holds for this, I mean, something that I'm still interested in. I think we should be working in. We can improve upon the cleaning scheduling work by considering more than one cleaning vehicle to clean the field, as well as multiple depots. This means where do they collect the water from? Because they have a limited capacity and they must return, collect more water, clean, uh, etc. Also, a field of research that is actually ongoing by other researchers is how to use unmanned aerial vehicles to do this problem. They have a, a limited water carrying capacity, but if you can have a swarm of these vehicles and uh, optimize their, their paths from, for example, a, a central vehicle, which can move between parts of the field and charge them, it would be interesting to optimize how they would clean the field, and what would be, would be the best way. And this would also allow us to, both of these points, optimize how we design the fields before we build them. Another piece that is very interesting is to do with the storage of energy. Part of the technology capable of these power plants is to store the thermal energy captured in molten salt. And that can be actually stored in a container and used later on. It doesn't have to be used at the moment. So if we can look at how we store this energy, we could then look at how we can sell that later on, for example. So in, in an economical economics point of view, the market price of energy would be higher when there is no sun available at night. So that's something to look at. And also to do with the storage of that energy, the thermal loss due to that storage. So we could optimize how and when to sell that energy and how best to store it. The final part is more of a... Um, um, a mix of various things that we've looked at. If we've considered the aiming strategy, what we've stopped at is the radiation distribution on the receiver surface. That's not the whole problem. One of the biggest parts is how that thermal energy is then transferred through the material and enters into the, the transfer fluid, it's called. So that thermal energy enters into a fluid and it is then transferred down the tower to be used to generate energy. So obviously there's losses in the transfer of that fluid, also from the receiver surface, there is a advection convection, so more energy is lost. So what we want to do is to make a numerical model of the entire receiver and then couple that with our aiming strategy optimizations 
to have a, a full model of the entire process. So we can optimize the aiming strategy whilst considering the design of the thermal receiver and how the thermal energy is moving through the receiver surface. And also we can then look at design parameters, how we could design that uh, receiver to maximize the energy that comes out. So really there's, there are many things that we could do in this topic and many problems that, uh, mathematical problems that we could apply. So all in all, I believe it's a fairly interesting uh, topic and uh, I hope it's been, it's been of interest to you. Very well, thank you very much uh, for this, uh, <clears throat> for your talk. So uh, it's uh, rather late, but uh, we have uh, still time for one question, one comment, if you have uh, uh, before, before, before leaving. Is there any question there? Okay, uh, we are going to stop. So uh, uh, thank you very much for participating to all of you. And uh, we hope you will be there also next week. Uh, next week we have, uh, I think that the, there will be Freddy Strolls that is going to speak, uh, Freddy Trolls from the Technische Universität de Berlin, Germany. And he's going to give a very interesting talk on optimal control problems uh, with controls appearing uh, non-linearly and 